everybody doing? Awesome. We're so excited to worship this morning. If you guys want to go ahead and come down front. Everybody have a good weekend? Yeah. All right. We're going to go ahead and start.
the Lord was uh, speaking to me um, this week about some things, and uh, I just wanted to share them. Um, sometimes when uh, we have disappointments in our life, um, the way we act to them um, is important to God. Um, he... Uh, he is there for us, and he wants to encourage us that when our plans don't pan out, um, and they're really, um, there's no way that our plan's going to work, um, and we feel that, well, why not, God? What happened? What's going on? Um, God says, just let go of that plan. Just let it go. And um, I have a much better plan, and that trust in him, just like these songs have been saying. Uh, just trust in him because it's way better than your plan. Just let it go and trust. Thank you, Jesus. We trust the Lord, trust the plan.
song of praise. Sing, we love you. And we love you, Lord. Mercy triumphs over judgment. The Lord would speak unto you this day that even as it's written in John 8, when a woman was caught in the act of adultery and in her shame, in her fear, in her self-disgust, in her shattered state, It was I and the courts of heaven that did mandate mercy. For I looked upon her plight and I saw the trap and I saw the failure and I conveyed away her sin that she might walk in newness of life. And when the world gave up on you, it was I that looked upon you with tender eyes that you might be reconciled unto me, that I might pour upon you my grace and goodness as the everlasting Father. For as a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those that fear him. For it is I that is in the world working to reconcile the world to myself and to the Father. For even if you would receive a greater revelation of my kindness and my mercy to you, you will be even more effective, says the Lord, to go into the highways and the byways and to find other disqualified people that you might share of my love, that this is in fact the acceptable day of the Lord. This is not the day that I come to judge, but it is the day that I call the unworthy, the lame, and the blind. I call the disenfranchised to my house, for my house shall be a place where those who've been cut off, rejected, shall find hope and mercy, shall find paths to dwell in, says the Lord. I am doing a new thing in this house, says the Lord. I will cause them to come from the north, the south, the east, and the west. They will come broken. They will come shattered. They will come disbelieving that God has a home and a place for them. 
but I will work in you and I will work through you and you will find a new boldness, says the Lord. To declare my goodness and my mercy, says the Lord. Bond that word by just receiving that love from the Father. He loves us and he loves us and oh how he loves us oh how he loves us oh how he loves us he loves us and he loves us Just our voices he loves. God, we thank you so much that you are speaking to your church today, God, about your goodness, your faithfulness, and your love toward us, God. Lord, we're so amazed by your love and your faithfulness. God, we worship you this morning. God, we magnify your name. God, we honor you today, God, because you are faithful. We can build our life on you. You don't change. You don't move, God. And we thank you, God, for your constant faithfulness and love toward us. And today, we give that back. Today, we say thank you for this love. Thank you for this grace and this mercy, God. We would not be where we are today without you, Jesus. We magnify your name today, God. We thank you, Jesus, for all that you have done and all that you're going to do and all that you are doing in our life. God, we worship you this morning. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. amen. Awesome. Well, you may be seated. Thank you so much for coming. Welcome to Joy Church. If this is your first time here, we are so thankful that you came to celebrate with us today. And we, we hope and we pray that you become part of the Joy family. And there's a, a few ways that you can do that. One way that we would love for you to do that is there's a card in front of you. You can fill it out. It says, welcome. We want you to get your information and get to know you. And if you fill that out, you can drop that into the, the offering bucket as it goes by. But if you have time after service, we would love to personally meet you and greet you and get to know you. We have a connections table in the back in the foyer as you head out the back doors. Please stop by. Get to know someone. Let us meet you and greet you and get to know you. Also, another way that you can get involved is our connect groups. And these happen every other week. So this week we do not have it, but next week we will have our connect groups. We have them for children's. We have them for, for CYM, Circle Youth Ministries, Youth Net. We have them for men and women all over the valley, different parts of the week. So I promise you there's one for you. If you want more information about that, please also go back, visit our uh, connection center in the back as well, or you can visit us at joychristianfellowship.com. There's lots of information how you can get involved in a connect group. How many of you guys are excited about Thanksgiving week? It's pretty awesome. We're so excited, and we know that as we head into the holidays, it's so important that we keep our heart right, our spirit right, especially as we go into this week of, of Thanksgiving. Make sure that we are, are thanking God, that we have hearts of, of gratitude and thanksgiving. And one of the ways that we're going to do that is we're inviting the whole church out tonight to worship and pray together. It's going to be an awesome night. It's tonight at 6 o'clock, we would love for you to come. It's going to be about an hour to an hour and a half. And we would just love for you to come and celebrate with us, prepare our hearts for the holidays holiday season as we as we head in. And due to Thanksgiving, we also do not have our Wednesday weekly service. So just so you know, don't come up, don't come on Wednesday because we won't be here. Please enjoy time with your family and friends and enjoy this week of Thanksgiving. Awesome. Well, we're going to welcome up Gino. Thanks, Mel. I'm very moved by our worship today and just the prophetic words that God has given. Anybody else moved? It makes me really think about the price of what Christ paid for us. 
He gave everything. He gave pretty much every drop of blood. He gave his body, right, to pay a price so that we could have life. And I feel like that's a bit of the theme today, just thinking about what Christ did. Really thinking about that cost. Sometimes it can seem trivial. It can seem like, well, he was God, and so it was easy, but he was also a man, right? Every one of those nails hurt just as bad as it would hurt us. And worse is the pain of this, the sin of the world, the pain of the world, the depression of the world being put on his shoulders. And so I, I, that's not what our giving talk is about today, but I just wanted, just thinking about that and just reflecting even this week of Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is about thanking people and thanking God for what we've been given, right? Our God has given us so much, and that gives us so much to be thankful for. It gives us so much to give thanksgiving about. What are you saying? Oh, Pastor Kim, she's singing a song of agreement, I'm pretty sure. Well, in just a moment, we're going to be taking up our tithes and offerings. And for those of us that don't know, our tithe is that 10%, the first 10% of our income that we uh, give to God. And our offerings is anything above that, that out of our own free will, we decide to give. But before we do, I want to share with you um, two scriptures, the words of Jesus, that um, there's a thought inside of what Jesus is saying that has definitely changed my life. It's something I've been thinking about recently, and I'd like to share it with you. Our scriptures are in Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 and 25. It says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. Here Jesus is saying that the only way to save our lives is to give them up for him. It doesn't seem to make sense. Give something to get. I call what Jesus is teaching the paradox of giving. Paradox. That's not a word we use every day, right? So I can take that, use it in lunch today, be like, this burger is a paradox. It doesn't matter if we know, even knows what it means. It just sounds awesome, right? But I looked it up on Merriam-Webster, and here is what paradox means. A paradox is a statement that seems to say two opposite things, but that may be true. I believe that what Jesus is saying here, this idea of you have to give to get is a paradox. It doesn't seem to make sense. Give something away to get, and yet it's actually true. The paradox of giving is that we must give and not just, and not, we must give to get. Sorry, I read it wrong. The paradox is giving is, is that to get we must give and not just give, and this is the important part, but give from our very heart and core. We must give generously. It seems too impossible, and yet it's true, and it works in many areas of our life. I haven't actually found one area where this paradox of giving doesn't work, so if you find one, let me know. It works in our marriage, it works in our finances, it works in our jobs. And I want to just give you an example of in your marriage and how the paradox of giving works, how this idea of giving to get actually works. You know, the, for those that are married, you may want something from your spouse, right? You may have a longing for love or a longing for attention or for them to take you on a certain kind of date. But as long as you pester them, as long as you push them, you're not going to get it. But you've probably seen this for any successful marriage in here. When you begin to think about their desires, their wants, their needs, and not out of a selfish, superficial heart, but truly and sincerely give to them, you'll begin to receive that which you could not beg, borrow, or steal before. Any married couples agree with that? It's this paradox of giving. It's this idea of relaxing, trusting God, releasing and saying, I'm going to give, even out of my lack, even out of, you know, a person, maybe you didn't have a great father, but you said, I'm going to be a great father to my kids. Maybe you didn't see a marriage as exemplified. I'm going to give love. And watch the paradox of giving work. Watch as you give sincerely and from your very heart and core, and you will get. Amen? We can try to take, take. And receive and receive. But only when we start to really and sincerely give will we begin to see the results we've truly wanted. And here's the important thing. Even better results. Garth Brooks has a song, Thank God for Unanswered Prayers. 
And God knows you better than you know yourself. And when you give and when you trust, he will surprise you with blessings you hadn't even thought to ask for. And that's a beautiful thing. So right now, let's take up our offering. And please consider this in giving and in every aspect of your life. Thank you, ushers. Father God, right now, we receive these tithes and offerings and we give them to you, Lord. We pray you'd bless the givers and bless uh, these finances that go out to, to build your kingdom and do your work, Father. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Children, you are dismissed to your classes. Have a great time. And right now, let's give a big uh, round of applause for our uh, pastor, Pastor Steve. All right. I like those English lessons where they say, use it in a sentence. Paradox. Gina was talking about paradox. Well, I like to, while people are getting their children uh, to their classes and then come back, I like to usually do stuff that interests me. It may bore you stiff, but that's why you go to the trouble of establishing a church as you want be able to lead out with your, your stuff. So yesterday I, I had this trauma that occurred around 6.30 at night. Uh, Johnny had invited a few, I was thinking maybe 10 junior high young men to come uh, in high school to come spend the night just, and 30 showed up. <laughs> Stop it. Hey, don't applaud yourselves. You guys didn't do anything. You ate, ate my food and, and, and a... Oh, I'm sorry, I exaggerated. There's only 29. But there may have been more than 29 when you consider the hyperness factor. They multiply. And, uh, and so then in addition, Terry uh, and Debbie Edders, they brought over their son, Johnny, and he spent the night. And, and so they had their Labrador. She's a chocolate lab named Cherry. And they brought her in, and, and the dogs in the house, the paradox, the para, the, I'm using it in a phrase, paradox, the paradox began to snarl and fight in the house. In addition to 29, I just turned to someone and said, this house is just a dog fight, you know. <laughs> but anyway, so uh, we had a paradox there, paradox. That's what I thought the word meant. Anyway, uh, so one of the young guys broke his foot. Nothing like, welcome to joy. We break your foot. The little lamb gets the foot broken. So the dad comes, picks up the young guy. I didn't know the little guy, the young guy. And I didn't know his dad, but he was happy. He said spit happens, and so he was all fine, you know. And uh, Christian took the, 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 the kid to uh, the hospital now, Christian is named Christian, but he's the only real Christian I know. He's a honeymooner, and he was there with all those guys. So either he's a really godly young man, or he's got brain damage, but whatever, or both. But So after Christian is taking the young guy to the hospital, and, and I'm watching like the crawling locusts, the swarming locusts, you know, all those things in the book of, uh, what is it, Amos or Joel? Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're eating, they're devouring, and they're hyper, and they're happy, and they're drinking. Johnny figured 900 ounces of sugar water, soda. Like they really needed to get sugared up. So Kim looked at me. She realized the meltdown was starting to happen. And kids were coming up and hugging me. Thank you for inviting me here, I thought. No problem. I love it. Forgive me, Lord, for sinning. She said, honey, would you like to go upstairs? I go, well, if you really think I should. Her and Johnny are energized by that. I can do a week's work just stressing over that many people. 
little hands grabbing. And I just shampooed the carpet. Got up this morning, and the children of the corn had completely cleaned the house. It was great. I'm staying with Kim, though, okay? I'm not getting rid of my wife because you guys can clean. I love her, and that's just the way it's going to work. Anyway, I want to announce the uh, upcoming meetings. First of all, let's just have a great week this week. Thanksgiving, absolutely my favorite holiday of the year. And I know that I'm supposed to say Christmas, and, and I do love Christmas. I love the Christmas carols. I love all that, but it costs money. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and so, so uh, I'm not the Scrooge I used to be, but I'm not, I'm not where I need to be. But I do love Christmas. My wife has turned me into Christmas. She, she would like to have Christmas 365 days a year. Uh, Riley's uh, dad and uncles, that was the best time of year when they were being raised up on the farm and their dad was an alcoholic. So always at Christmas, the boys would decorate. And it was such a wonderful time that, that when you go to the Amon's hazelnut farm, it's just gorgeous just underneath the uh, monastery at Mount Angel. And they've got Christmas carols playing middle of July. They, just, they said, well, if it was happy then, let's have Christmas all the time. Which is why, of course, Kim said that Riley was welcome in the family. Anyone that loves Christmas that much. Thanksgiving is great. I love Thanksgiving. Oh, okay. Kind of was feeling that panic I did last night, you know, and there's nobody agreeing. Thanksgiving is fun. I, I want every one of you to have a great Thanksgiving. Get with family and friends and just love each other. Uh, in our house, we have four turkeys. We have two that we're going to cook, and then Johnny and I are going to stay there and eat them. And uh, so we got four turkeys. Looking forward to Thanksgiving. And, uh, and I just pray that you have a great one. We're going to have a great time of worship tonight. I believe it's at 6, as usual. And then uh, next week, the, the Dove. How many of you watch uh, Dove TV? Have you been seeing ads for the Dan Bohe meetings? And how many have been seeing them? My sister that, that's up in the hospital, Sharon, I went there. She said, hey, Joy's all over the, the Dove. They're advertising the meetings. And I thought, well, cool. That's good. Uh, really excited. Uh, Craig Wrench has been a long-term friend of mine and a tremendous uh, amount of prayer. And, uh, and uh, God has used him uh, through a lot of our influence uh, Craig was pastoring Anaheim uh, Nazarene Church and in Anaheim, California, and, and he learned about G12, and he, he got a hold of us and said, hey, could you teach me more about this G12? We were doing a vacation in San Diego a number of years ago, and Craig came down, and in a park, he just knelt down in the ground right there, said, lay hands on me to Kim and I and the kids, and said, in part, he ended up writing G12 under the, 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 the name master's plan and it's the official church planting and growth uh, of the Nazarene denomination. Craig is, uh, he does not speak in tongues but he's one of the most mystical guys. Uh, we went to the church in Anaheim. He had us prophesy over people, give words of knowledge. That was years ago. And so uh, he ended up uh, commissioning about, about a dozen churches out of his, his church in Anaheim. And uh, God has put him with a, at a tongue-talking, spirit-filled businessman uh, who's moving in signs and wonders. He's a Nazarene. Craig had told me, he said, God has put in my spirit that, I'm gonna, that he, Craig, is going to help the Nazarene denomination to get back to their roots. The, uh, the Nazarene church, which forbids their pastors to speak in tongues, was called the Pentecostal Nazarene church when they first came out of the same roots we all did out of Azusa Street. Craig said, it's to my advantage that God hasn't given me the gift because if I spoke in tongues, then my credibility would be somewhat questioned. But, but here he, he's traveling with a guy that, that because he's a businessman and, he, and he's not uh, one of the pastors, he can pray in his prayer language. And so this guy, multimillionaire, lost, uh, lost money, and the Lord spoke to him, said, buy a Bible. He said, I've got Bibles all over the house. He said, no, I said, buy one. In other words, use it. 
And Dan began to just soak in the word, and God began to pour out signs and wonders. So it was kind of a mystical connection, this connection, how they're coming here. I was at a wedding, and I was talking to someone. They said, hey, did you hear what Craig's doing? And I said, no, I didn't. I haven't talked to Craig for a while. I said, yeah, he's traveling with a guy named Dan Bohe. They're doing this and that. Holy Spirit said, listen up. You hear that little something mystical's happening. And so I said, okay. About two days later, I get a call from Craig. Do you hear what I'm doing? Yeah, I just heard the other day. Well, we want to know. We need a church that will host us in Medford. I said, we're in. So what am I saying? I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> but, but, but I've learned one thing. If you respond to the Holy Spirit and you, some really crazy things are going to happen. And so there's, there's going to be a lot of people from other churches and our goal as tongue talking Pentecostals is not to freak everybody out. Our job is not to make the gifts of the Spirit a magic show. How many of you know that if you pray in tongues and you hear the voice of the Lord and, and you have that sense of the power that Jesus said would happen, that's good enough. You don't need to try to make it weird, wacky, and mystical. And so that has been our reputation among the evangelicals in town that, that that we've been a church that loves the unity. And I, I know a lot of the Nazarene leadership will be here. Uh, Dale, the new pastor at the Naz, said he was going to come and, uh, and so forth. I am telling you because I don't want you to get ripped off by thinking, well, I don't know if this is going to be good. Too many times joy people have done that. They kind of sat out and, and then later and go, oh, darn it, I wish I had been there. Well, don't darn it, just get here. Dan's going to be speaking here next Sunday. And then uh, on Monday, Craig is going to be doing a teaching uh, from noon till 1 and then from 6 to 7 on prayer. He's, he's a good teacher. He's a good educator. He's the kind of guy that says, if I had my choice, I'd just pray eight hours a day. And that's him. That's, that's who he has always been. He didn't fluff this up. He didn't become that. He's always been that since I've known Craig. Man of prayer. I said this, I think we need to invite him in prayer. As a pastor, I look at what we need. How many of you know, like, like our physical body, we have certain vitamins we need? I just really feel we need the vitamin of prayer because prayer is how we get the things we need from God. There's some things that happen that God just supernaturally does. And then there are other things that you, you start by the supernatural initiation of prayer. So I'm pumped. I said, Craig, do it. Do your thing. I don't, I don't know who will be here, but I know one thing. When you're hungry, <laughs> you want to go eat. If you're hungry for the things of the Spirit, you're hungry for the move of God, uh, that is real. How many of you say, fake we don't need, but real we, we'll take? Okay. And I know one thing, that we're going to have, good, we're gonna have a, a good time. And, and, and uh, a good time was had by all, and all were had by the good time. So let's, let's just see what God is doing. And I'm pumped because, wow, great holiday coming up, family, friends, all kinds of stuff, great worship time tonight. And not only that, but you get the salad spinner and Mr. Microphone if you come to these meetings. No. Now, this isn't Ron Popeil, but I'm, I, am, I am excited. And uh, I never like to pump something that I don't feel is really a God thing. You know, there's some times that we're going to have really good teaching, and we don't have to say, come, hear this teaching. It'll be the, it'll rock your face off. No, it only slightly melted one side. You know, you lied to me. But I really think that we're going to all be able to come and say, wow. Wow. Or maybe we'll come and go, oh, my gosh, and have our face rocked off. But what I know is when I get those mystical guidances, I've learned don't ignore them. That God, God talks. Okay. Now we're back. Let's get to work, you guys. Quit distracting me. T today we're carrying on. I'm carrying on uh, with the wisdom wise does. Wisdom lives, and I put the word righteously. Today this message is going to be PG. I'm going to handle some sensitive areas that, you know, like, uh, like that young guy said, hide your kids, hide your wife, you know. You know, hide your husbands too. 
I'm going to tackle some things about burning your world down. Just a, a story from our history at Joy. In the late 80s, or early 90s, we had what we named the girl's house, and it was a rental. And a family was renting the house, and they had two little boys that were about maybe six and eight. And so uh, the advantage of renting our little house, they had the whole playground to play in, but they also had a field, the field back here. We didn't have it all sterilized and killed like we do now. And so the little boys on a hot, I think it was an August day, with a steady south wind blowing, which means it's blowing, uh, or a north wind blowing, it, no, it's blowing from the south, so it's a south wind was blowing north, and they took a little packet of matches. Now think about the value of matches. Okay, you can go to Dollar Tree and get a packet of matches for a dollar, a big one. And so when you look at like one tenth of that pack, so you, ten cents of matches and a little boy's we're just so excited. This is great. And they were flipping matches. And it, it hit the grass on Joy's property. And they tried to stomp it out. And it kept spreading. And they ran in. And our associate pastor at the time, Bob Rood, came out and tried to get a hose. And it the wind blew it, blew it right into, now it's a housing division. But it used to be a Mr. Hayes a Christian man had a, a hay business where he'd store hay and he would sell it to farmers and stuff in the area. The fire crossed the, the property lines, went up and burnt up his barn, burnt up his bay, bay, killed horses, killed rabbits he was raising back there. Less than 10 cents worth of product created $300,000 worth of damage. How many of you know in life that God speaks, there's a future every baby that's born? I look at every baby and I see that they're a, they're a blackboard to be written on. I don't, I don't think that, that if you're born as a white baby, you're, you're, you're born into privilege. And I don't think that if you're born black, as the Planned Parenthood does, this is a potential criminal. Planned Parenthood has been proven to be part of the whole eugenics movement that the Nazis were a part of and target black people for abortion. I look at black babies, I look at white babies, I look at Mexican babies, I look at Thai babies, I look at Cambodian babies, I look at every baby and I know one thing, that when they're born, two kingdoms begin to work for them. The kingdom of darkness to bring them into destruction, to burn their life down, to destroy the image of God in them, and the kingdom of God is seeking to bring uh, conviction through the Holy Spirit, to bring the gospel and bring life. Now, after babies are born, there's an innocence that seems to carry on until things around and the sin nature from within begins to corrode and corrupt. Enter the gospel. When you receive the gospel of Jesus Christ, what you say is, I'm incapable of cleansing my, my own sins. I'm incapable of changing that nature which is destined to corrode and corrupt and violate your principles and your law, and I need help. And, and, and the Holy Spirit comes in you. Your sins are washed. You are positionally made innocent of all sin. It does not take away all the consequences of what you've done. You receive Jesus Christ, and let's say you're, you're, you're a murderer, and you're in a state that still has capital punishment, if we have any left, and, uh, and, and, and it doesn't mean that you get, you get acquitted from it. But before heaven, you are freely forgiven. So I would like to speak today about wisdom lives righteously. Don't play with fire 
or you will get burned. Sinful behaviors and going against sound counsel will burn you. How many of you know we have a great amount of help as believers? We have the best document ever written, the Word of God. Still the world's number one bestseller. How many of you know that most of us, we've got really good Bibles because it says holy in front of it. Not just Bible, it says holy Bible. Right? How many of you have a holy Bible? Aren't you glad you didn't have a sinful one? Yeah. We've got the Bible. We have the Holy Spirit who takes up residence in us. We have our own attorney, our counselor speaking into us. We have the house of God. We have Jesus at the right hand of the Father interceding for us. We have the other believers around the world praying for us and in the house of God, people praying for us. We have small groups where people can speak into our insanity if we'll talk about what's lurking in our heads. We've got counselors. We've got, we've got documents. We have training. We have outlines. We have classes. And yet people still burn their life down. They do it in the world. How many of you in, 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 in just the news from real, uh, right now are glad your name is not Anthony Weiner? I'm glad my name's not Weiner to begin with. Even my sisters used to just call me Weiner Boy and stuff like that. They abused me. But Anthony Weiner, the, 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 the political figure and stuff that's, that's been a subject of news, he was not made for destruction. He's made choices. People make choices. And God's mercy reaches and reaches and reaches and reaches. Today I want to just talk with you about what it means to burn your life down. What, to, what is this metaphor of don't play with fire speak of? Well, we know that in the case of like the little boys that burnt the field and, and uh, you know, it did save us 15 bucks from having to have that portion uh, mowed. Excuse me, that's just, that's the tightness in me talking. But <laughs> don't play with fire is a metaphor for don't do destructive behaviors that set off a series of disastrous results. The Bible is full of warnings to keep us from burning down our lives. If you read the words that Paul gave the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20, he said, I have warned you for the space of three years, day and night, I've warned you with tears. Well, you know, if Paul was really a positive guy, why would you take time to warn people? This gospel is all good news. No, the gospel makes sense and it's good news, but it becomes great news when you don't burn your house down. How many say, I live because of mercy, but grace wants to build me a house that isn't going to be burned down by crazy behaviors? Proverbs 14, 1 says, a wise woman builds her home, but a foolish one tears it down with her own hands. I've got a couple of Lauras that I'm really sweet on. Uh, in, in, in public figures. One is, is Laura Ingram, just caustic kind of a, you know, pundit. She's funny and, uh, and, and, and a super conservative girl. And then uh, Laura Schlesinger, Dr. Laura. Dr. Laura wrote a book called uh, uh, 10 Crazy Things That Women Do to Destroy Their Lives. Now, I've never been a woman But hearing Dr. Laura field calls, they, they canceled her here locally. And, and, you know, and I don't know if she still got her, in, her national program. But, you know, it was like, okay, wow. Grab a sign sometimes, people calling in. Well, um, you know, I'm having a relationship with a married guy at work, and he says he really loves me. And Laura's going, ah, and abusing the person. You're crazy. You're worse than crazy. You're neurotic. Why do women do this? Why do we melt down and kill ourselves and burn our house down? Next, equally stupid. Come on now. How many of you know we've got scripture today? A wise woman builds her house. She's not going to keep loading up her kids with criticism. One young man said that his family used to always say he was a stupid one. He was a stupid one. He was a stupid one. 
I want to tell you something. It doesn't matter whether you yell at a child or you speak it into a child. Girls, the power of your mouth is going to affect what goes on with your children and your husband. Rah, 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 the exaggeration. You can burn your house down and then find plenty of room for tears when it's all burnt. Use your mouth critically. You can get your husband to quit the church. Pretty soon he's back to swigging beers. Pretty soon he finds little Lulu who's cuter than you. Well, look what the devil did. The devil, the devil was there. But sometimes the devil doesn't need a whole lot of help because we're helping him all we can as we burn our own house down. That's why we need good counsel from people around us. When you're frustrated and you want to do a lot of dumb stuff, talk to somebody. Do you know why we don't talk to people when we're about ready to do dumb stuff? Because we already know the answer. And we're being lust driven to just put it into play. In Proverbs 16, 18, so that we can get onto the guys and not just leave it on the girls. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Like one guy said down in Texas, you know, you know there's trouble brewing when a guy says, here, hold my Lone Star and watch this. The guy's had a few beers and now he's really, he's ready to take on the world. And then you see the video of, you know, the greatest blunders and spills and disastrous things that go on. Pride is that way. This investment is too good to fail and you know, I, I've, you know, one party was, before the election, was flying in the jets, already celebrating the victory. It was the party that didn't win. How many of you know that you, you got to stay humble? Can I tell you when to really rejoice when your team wins? When the buzzers ended and the fans are leaving the field. That one's in the books. Same thing in life. Live life humbly. Hello? Now, Proverbs chapter 6, and this is where I'm going to move into the PG area. My son, obey your father's commands and don't neglect your mother's instructions. Keep their words always in your heart. Tie them around your neck. When you walk, their counsel will lead you. When you sleep, they will protect you. When you wake up, they will advise you. For their command is a lamp and their instruction a light. Their corrective discipline is the way to life. Guys, that's what we're doing with our kids. And you guys are doing a great job. The way I exhort you to think, no one here is doing anything at all, ever. But I know you are, because I see the fruit. Lots of really good kids. It means mom and dad are doing a good job. But never get it. Don't ever make a mistake. Your job is to bring corrective discipline. Correct means to write something that's wrong. You know? Your kids don't naturally gravitate to the right decision. Yeah, I think I want ice cream all the time, and, you know, I don't think I would like green beans. Really? You feel led that way? Cool. Eat your green beans anyway. The corrective discipline is the way to life. It will keep you from the immoral woman or bad boys. Girls are attracted to bad boys. Oh, if I could just get my hands on that hunk, you know, my love is going to change him. No, your love is going to get you knocked up. Living in a single wide, waiting for, waiting for the next guy on a white shiny horse to, to, to. hello? Marry what you want, not thinking that you're betting on the come and you're going to go make your man. If you marry boneless chicken, you get boneless chicken. If you marry Jezebel, you get Jezebel. My wife's saying true, and she's doing that with a question in her voice. It will keep you from the immoral woman, from the smooth tongue of a promiscuous woman. Don't lust for her beauty. Don't let her coy glances seduce you. This message is about seduction, even though I'm going to primarily be dealing with uh, 
you know, uh, sexual seduction, it, it carries over to every seduction. Gambling is an, a seduction. Gluttony is a seduction. Slothfulness is a seduction. Being given only to entertainment is a seduction. There is a lot of seducing spirits in the earth today. Same ones that have been around a while, they just have better technology to work with. The corrective discipline will keep you from the immoral woman. Don't lust for her beauty. Don't let her, her coy glances seduce you. For a prostitute will bring you to poverty, but sleeping with another man's wife will cost you your life. Figuratively, it'll burn your life down. Can a man scoop a flame into his lap and not have his clothes catch on fire? Can he walk on hot coals and not blister his feet? So it is with the man who sleeps with another man's wife. He who embraces her will not go unpunished. Excuses might be found for a thief who steals because he is starving. But if he is caught, he must pay back seven times what he stole, even if he has to sell everything in his house. But the man who commits adultery is an utter fool, for he destroys himself. He will be wounded and disgraced. His shame will never be erased. For the woman's jealous husband will be furious and he will show no mercy when he takes revenge. He will accept no compensation nor be satisfied with a payoff of any size. I want to take you to the life of David. I want to read to you parts of the portion of his mistake with Bathsheba. I want to tell you Guaranteed once a year or twice a year when I read this, because with our Bible program, I think we sometimes go over certain things a couple times. Once, uh, I guess it's just once through the Old Testament. Every time I read about David's fall, I cry. And I have to read Psalm 51 to feel good again. He was so good. What he did was so wrong. when he really did a great job of burning his house down. If you read about the fall of David, would you please read Psalm 51? When you hear how he wept and cried before God, God created me a clean heart, put a steadfast spirit in me. The bones that you have broken, you were just in doing. If you could take burnt sacrifice, you know I would offer it to you. But the sacrifices of God are a broken and a contrite spirit. And these he will not despise. I'm so tired of Christians wanting to see how nasty they can be, how drunk they can get, how worldly they can be. We were saved out of the world to be brought as a chaste bride before the one that redeemed us from our former folly. And that's why David could go through, and we're going to see what David did and the consequences that he paid, though he was fully forgiven and still considered a man after God's heart. Second Samuel 11, verses 1 and following, it says, It happened in the spring of the year, at the time when kings go out to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. In the time that kings go to war, Dave wasn't. Look me in the eye. Read my lips. My greatest joy would be to die in the pulpit. One, it would freak you guys out that we're napping. <laughs> Not today. Not until after Thanksgiving. And then I might, oh my God, I wish I could just die when I've eaten like two of those turkeys. Johnny and another one. No, no, just. I believe that my security will be if I never quit going out to war. As long as there's a push, as long as there's families we want to rescue, as long as there's churches we want to plant, as long as there's missionaries that we need to encourage and new missionaries to be sent while there's war, I want to put on my sword and even if I can't physically do much, I'm going to let them know what side I'm on. And David was that kind of a man, and I don't know why he was setting out this one. But it cost him a lot. 
Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful to behold. So David sent and inquired about the woman, and someone said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Uriah was one of the mighty men, of David's mighty men. This wasn't just a random guy. Then David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. For she was cleansed from her impurity, and she returned to her house. And the woman conceived, so she sent and told David and said, I am with child. Then David sent to Joab, saying, Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. The minute that, that David began to scheme with Uriah, he tried to scheme to get Uriah maybe to have intercourse with his wife so the timing of the pregnancy would not blow his cover. He was hiding a grave, burn your house down kind of an event. And, and it progressed that he killed Uriah with the, with the sword of Ammon. And the company that David was used to traveling with one of his dear friends, the prophet Nathan, has to come to him. And that's where I want to pick up the story. Because David was a man whose world was flaming. It was on fire. And the consequences were going to be devastating. And so the Lord sent Nathan, the prophet, 2 Samuel 12, starting at verse 1, to tell David this story. There were two men in a certain town. One was rich and one was poor. The rich man owed a great many, owned a great many sheep and cattle. The poor man owned nothing but one little lamb he had bought. He raised that little lamb and, and, and it grew up with his children. It ate from the man's own plate and drank from his cup. He cuddled it in his arms like a baby daughter. One day a guest arrived at the home of the rich man. But instead of killing an animal from his own flock or herd, he took the poor man's lamb and killed it and prepared it for his guest. David was furious. As surely as the Lord lives, he vowed, any man who would do such a thing deserves to die. He must repay four lambs to the poor man for the one he stole and for having no pity. Then Nathan said to David, you are that man. The Lord, the God of Israel, says, I anointed you king of Israel and saved you from the power of Saul. I gave you your master's house and his wives in the kingdom of Israel and Judah. And if that had not been enough, I would have given you much, much more. Why then have you despised the word of the Lord and done this horrible deed? For you have murdered Uriah the Hittite with the sword of the Ammonites and stolen his wife. From this time on, your family will live by the sword because you have despised me by taking Uriah's wife to be your own. This is what the Lord says. Because of what you have done, I will cause your own household to rebel against you. I will give your wives to another man before your very eyes, and he will go to bed with them in public view. You did it secretly, but I will make this happen to you openly in the sight of all Israel. Then David confessed to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, yes, but the Lord has forgiven you, and you won't die for this sin. Nevertheless, because you have shown utter contempt for the Lord by doing this, your child will die. The story goes on. That God had said, you burned your house down. He didn't burn down the prophetic picture that the house of David was to be established forever. God reconfirmed. But he began to see in his nuclear family that he set a stage of consequences because he was playing with matches and he didn't count the cost. The Lord said, here's a story that a man, you know, had a lamb that was stolen when he had other lambs he could have taken. And so four to one was to be the trade-off. 
Well, we see here that you could say, well, Bathsheba was that lamb. I don't know. I think maybe Uriah was the lamb, the innocent man, because David lost four sons to death. Within a few months, he had a baby that was born, and God said, I'm taking the infant. And David, having been restored to his faith in God and to his prayer life with God, he fasted and he prayed. Don't take him. Please, God, don't take him. And then when the baby died, he dried his eyes and he went into the house of the Lord and he worshiped God. The son won. David had opened up the door of immorality and sensuality. Suddenly his boys that had known a godly man, now their dad is a dude that's just chipping away for the girls like the regular guys instead of being the man that's lost in prayer writing the Psalms. So the next son was Amnon who forces his sister Tamar to have sex with him. The sensuality that was opened up by David was now working in his son. And then he rejected after molesting his half-sister, the sister of Absalom. And Absalom designed a scheme whereby he killed his brother, son too, down. Absalom, later on, grew bitter towards David. He began to steal the hearts of the men and he rebelled against David and he was killed by Joab in battle, son three. And finally, Adonijah, the last son, was the one that they were trying to coronate when uh, they quickly had put Solomon in and Solomon was gonna leave Adonijah, but Adonijah was trying to get one of David's former concubines, that sensual, sexual thing, And he was usurping. Son four, executed by the command of Solomon. Because of what you've done, you're going to pay back four times. I want to just tell us, don't live, don't live curtly and with lots of pride. Well, you know, I can just do anything and I go to Jesus and, 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 and he forgives me. He may forgive you, but it doesn't mean he's going to take away the consequences in your life. I tell people this. You may outrun me. You may outrun a speeding bullet, but you'll never outrun the law of sowing and reaping. I don't know about you. I want to take a poll right now. How many of you men feel something in your heart that says, get it, get it, get it, and get it right? We've got to stand firm. We've got to stand true. We've got to have a heart that says, I'd rather be dead. I'd rather have God take me than to end up burning the house down, burning my reputation down, burning the sense of faith and security that my kids and that the, the people that I'm able to disciple and encourage. Our movement is filled with great examples like Pastor Iverson and others of guys that just go on and on and on and on and on. Faithfulness, integrity. That bunch from out of Bible Temple and MFI and Joy, they're so legalistic. I want to tell you something. When you get into the sleaze pool of drug addiction, there are no morals. People will sometimes send their wife to go sleep with someone so they can get another bag of dope. You're going to find more people that may look legalistic where there's actually some righteousness. All these judgments weren't coming against Moabite kings. They weren't in the covenant. God says, you're in my family. You're going to have a different standard than when you're just the average old Fat and lusty Moabite. The consequences to David, four dead sons, 
David's behavior introduced sensual impropriety into his family. Ammon raped his half-sister. Absalom openly had sex with David's concubines. It was Absalom that took David's concubines. And I, I think, it was, I'm, I'm hoping there was some kind of a tent up there. But all of Jerusalem, looking up to the citadel, could see that there was a tent there, a bedroom-type tent. And these women were going in one by one, being brought in. You have to realize women's rights were a lot different. You were basically bartering chips. It wasn't like these were all harlots. Then we saw Adonijah sought to, ha to have one of his deceased father's concubines or quasi-wife. And Solomon had sexual problems. I would say having a thousand wives or concubines, you might be extreme. I couldn't imagine having a thousand notes of what we're going to do on Saturday. <laughs> Would you, honey? Could you? It was, I almost felt that way last night. It was with those kids at the house. David's sterling character was permanently marred. David, David never extended the kingdom after that. Now, look at the mercy and the tenderness of God. David did generously give for the temple to be built, and he was fully forgiven by God. It was a rough, rough time for David. How does the playing with fire progress? Well, practical. Stage one, it seems fun and, ex and exciting. You ask people, well, how did you start smoking to begin with? I mean, anybody under 50... There should be nobody smoking now, right? Sorry, I didn't realize I was in the smokers' convention. <laughs> Even the ladies at Joy are lighting up pipes on the way out. No. <laughs> They've warned. Smoking may cause cancer. Smoking has proven. I mean, they got people that are talking to Hi, I'm Steve. I was a smoker. <laughs> I don't know about you. That scares me. You ask people, well, what happened? Well, it was kind of fun. You know, my friends were smoking, and they said, just try it. And Well, how did you get into the heavy drinking? You didn't read Proverbs 20? Who has redness of eye? Who wakes up with, you know, bruises on their head? He that's given to wine to watch it swirl in the cup? Well, it just seemed to make sense. We were all just having a drink or two. Yeah, I'll pull my son and throw no wine before it's time. People didn't come out of the womb as homeless. They didn't come out of the way out of the womb as drug addicts, and they came out like every other baby. Stage one, it's fun and exciting. Stage two, it, it captivates and requires energy to initiate. So you're starting to work the work the hustle. Wow, you know the guys. You know we got a bottle of wine, and let's see. I need to. How do I? Make my folks think I'm going to a prayer meeting. Well, it's communion. Okay, we'll call it communion. How many of you know that when lust and that's working in your head, you begin to give energy to it? Stage three, it always starts small. Sin has an interesting way. That it's just like an, a tree growing in your life. It'll always get bigger. It'll always lead to other weakness and temptation. Stage four, it begins to worry you and effort is expended to stop it. Like the little boys trying to stamp out the fire. And then my associate pastor, Bob, trying to spray it down with the hose and find out it still wasn't working. And by the time it hit the neighbor's property, it was a good fire, which the, which the fire department couldn't put out either. Stage five, it's out of control and the results are devastating. Stage six, the aftermath of destruction affects a lot of people. I want to finish this up by just saying this. Don't play with fire. I've heard people say, well, Jesus said, if you've lusted with a woman in your heart, you've already committed adultery. So why don't I just go ahead and do the action? Eh. Because Jesus was trying to teach 
that what we play out in our lives comes from the treasure or the uh, corruption from within. Now, let me just tell you the advantage of, of dealing with lust when it's in your heart as opposed to when you've rented a motel. See, if, if I had to go to prison for everybody I killed, how many of you just have killed a number of people on freeways in your heart? That trucker swerved yet, even my wife. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. That idiot drove really bad. <laughs> she's almost like an angel, and she's like killing people in her heart. <laughs> I'm so glad that I married Kim, who can get mad when drivers swerve in front of us, and not Ma Barker, who pulls a gun out and shoots. <laughs> you see, there are things that you may feel tempted. You may be dealing with lust in your heart, you're in dangerous ground when you go tell the person, I've got feelings for you. Okay, the fire's been lit. Jesus tells us what's going on inside of us so that we can arrest ourselves, you know, without completely burning the house down. So when I find myself judging with hatred and anger my brother, I can fix it long before he knows I think it works better in the house of God if you've hated someone. I've had people come to me, I've hated you for years. But God's given me a love now. They're all happy. Oh, I told him I made it right. You made it wrong. Now I'm thinking, what is wrong with me or them? Anybody ever had that? I've always despised you. But God's given me a special love. I wish he'd have given you wisdom. Now you're telling me that you've lived in fear and loathing all this time, low these many years. Same thing with, with, with what goes on when, it, when it's the things that we are tempted to do. Girls, this is why being a part of WOW is important. Guy, this is the reason that being a part of Men of Honor and being a part of Connect Group and letting somebody know you, talking about what's really on in your head, we can stop it before the flames take down your whole world. James goes into a little bit more elaborate in James 1. I don't have time to read it. But it basically his reasoning is, is don't ever say God's the one that's making you tempted. He's not tempted himself and he doesn't use it as a tool. And it goes on to a progression that it starts from our own lust and desire. And we give it energy. These desires give birth to sinful actions. And when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. One thing I know is if what I'm fixing to think about and do, I can't talk to anybody about, it ain't good. Let's all stand up. It's not good. I need to put it away. Now, today, the good news is that Jesus loves you and I. He forgives us of our sin. His desire is that, that, that especially people that are flirting with some really scary thoughts. I'm going to leave my husband. I'm going to leave my wife. I'm going to, you know, she doesn't, she doesn't love me like she should love me and and I'm going to contemplate how I can have some time alone with the computer. Come on now. The devil, when he seduced Eve and then Adam fell, he was told, you're going to crawl on your, your belly and you're going to eat the dust of the earth. That's a little bit disturbing to me because we're made from the dust of the earth. Satan uses our choices. He uses our strength like judo. As we make a rush of lust, this is what I want. Satan goes, cool. They've already got the energy. All I have to do is just place opportunity. Christians are notorious for always blaming the devil. 
Devil's been chasing me all week. Bless his holy name. No, he doesn't have a holy name. It's an unholy name. I'm not so worried about the devil. I'm greatly concerned about me. Because when me is walking in the spirit, when me is walking in the word, when me is walking with accountability, I'm going to be okay. When me gets isolated, Proverbs 18, 1, he that isolates himself rages against all sound judgment. When I'm not going to talk to anybody, when I'm not going to be accountable to anybody, when I am not going to deal with what's really going on in my life to my wife, my friends, leaders around me, I am a fire ready to burst into flame. How many of you know we've got precious tools all around us to avoid burning our life down? Paul said, I warned with tears every day, three years. I'm warning you, please don't burn your life down. Those that have done a good job so far, let's just not do it anymore. How many say, I know I've sinned and I just, I just want to drain a swamp of sin in my life. Anybody, anybody want to drain your swamp? You're forgiven immediately, but you've got to re, let the Lord retrain your mind. That which brought delight when you meditated on it, it's got to make you sick. You've got to throw up when you contemplate sin. That's why I cry every time I read about David. Because I think what it'd be like to look at my beautiful wife's brown eyes and have to say, oh, honey, the devil really tempted me. Because I know one thing, he is a sick puke who has no power that I don't give him. And I don't want to look in Kim's eyes. I don't want to have Jake look at me. Dad, I love you, but I can't understand why you did it. Don't understand why you embezzled. I don't understand why you slandered. I don't understand how you know there's a lot of things I don't want to explain because I don't want to get started what I can't sustain. And I can sustain prayer. I can sustain transparency. I can sustain being accountable. But I can't sustain sin because it always leads to death and the consequences hurt everybody around us. Right now, if you're here and you say, Pastor Steve, I want to come to Jesus. I, I know that, that God loves me. I know that he forgives sin. And I want to become a man or woman of God. I want to give my life to Jesus. I'd like every one of you that came here looking for a new start, if you would like to give your life to Jesus, we want to welcome you in. Come on down right now. We want to pray with you. You're not making a pledge that you'll never sin. You're not making a pledge that you'll never be tempted. What you're making a pledge is that you know that sin will not be eradicated in your life based on your own effort. You need a Savior to forgive your sin and change your root motivations. And that you desire to come into his house and into his kingdom and become a part of his family. Living his family values, not your own. Step right out right now. Every one of you that are here, if you would like to join God, and this is that opportunity, this is that time, we're so excited to welcome you into the family of God. <laughs> Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Father. I believe there are more here. How do you know if God's talking to you? Your heart's pounding. You also are hearing another voice saying, oh, don't do it, don't do it. Let me just tell you something. The devil has a vested interest in keeping you in the kingdom of darkness. The devil will never get happy about you doing what's right. And your heart pounds because there's something that says, that's really where I was born to be. I was born to be a child of God. I was born to live the clean life. And you may feel that you're, you're, you're hooked on drugs or you're hooked on any number of things. Let me tell you that that thing can get broken by the power of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. The blood of Jesus is stronger and steps on every drug addiction. It steps on every sexual addiction. The blood of Jesus is stronger than any force. And the name of Jesus is how we activate what he's done for us. Last call, if you're here and you say, man, I just want in. I want in. We're going to ask Jesus. We all do it together. I, you guys, look at me real quick. I'm so proud of you. So proud. So awesome. 
I've done dumb things in my life, things I've been ashamed of, but I'll tell you one day, when I got married to God, I'll never regret that day. I'm so proud of you. How many of you are proud when people step up to be a part of God's kingdom? We're going to pray. We have to pray quickly because I am so amped I could go another hour. (laughs) And my kids would kill me. And some of you would. Say these words with me. They're so, so beautiful. Dear Father, I come to you today. And I lift up my heart to you. I do not trust myself. My ability to say no. My ability to change my life. Sin has racked my life. It's captivated me. It's taken away my joy. It's taken away my love of life. I need you, God. You said that every one of us that call on your name are brought to your house, brought into your family. I believe, as the word says, that whoever calls on your name shall be saved. I'm calling on your name. I'm calling on the name of Jesus to save me. You also said that whoever calls upon your name would not be ashamed. I ask you, take away the shame from my life. Help me, God, by your spirit and by your power to walk in your way, that way of wisdom, which is to live righteously as you empower me. Today, oh God, if you'll be my God, I'll be your servant. If you'll be my father, I'll be your child. I receive you today, dear Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm all wound up today. I feel the hug of the Father just coming on the congregation. You're being stalked. God is going to hunt you down. And he's going to blast you with a two double-barrel shotgun. As David said, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Could we just lift up our hands? Could we just groan a little bit and say, God, you're so good. God, you're so merciful. God, you're the best trainer and teacher and pastor and discipler. You are my shepherd. Lord, you are our shepherd. You're awesome. We salute you today, God. We of Zion salute the King of Kings. We say, be lifted up, you doors and you gates, that the King of Glory may come in. Come on in. Come on in. Come on into my mind. Come on into my thoughts. Come on into this house. Come on into this city. Come on into the city council. Come on in and bless our mayor. Bless this state. This is a state that is being under assault of the kingdom of God. Come on, let's shout a little bit. Father, I'm asking you, I'm asking you to chase them home, love on them all day. Lord, I'm asking you to trouble some people in their sleep with new dreams of God's favor, God's blessing. You are for us and not against us. As we embrace the kingdom of God, bless your people, I pray. 
Grant them peace and wellness. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Hallelujah. We're going to have the elders and leaders down here praying for those of you who need some prayer, prayers of agreement, prayer for jobs, prayer over depression. We're used to seeing God turn things around. We'll see so many of you, hopefully all of you tonight at 6, we're going to have a time of praise and worship that will be good. <laughs> God bless you.